Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's good to see you. Um, it's good to be here and to gather in the house of the Lord together and to worship. I missed y'all last week. I wasn't here. I went back to, uh, to Longview Baptist Church to see if uh, they missed me. And uh, they did a little bit. I went for the homecoming uh, back uh, to the church I served for six and a half years before coming to you. And, um, you know, they, they told me they, they missed me, but they were so happy for the ministry that's been going on here and for what God's been doing uh, in our church. And I got to share some of those things with them. And so just reminded, you know, I, I mean, I was there and I missed you guys a whole lot, but just reminded of what a blessing it is to, to build one another up and have so many people come and, and just share that that, that was... That was something that pleased them, that in those six and a half years of ministry, God was preparing me to be here while also doing good works there. Amen? So I'm not, I'm not supposed to preach during the announcements and welcome, but it could happen at any time. Good morning, though, and, and welcome again. Welcome to those of you who might be visiting us this morning. It is so good to see you and to see your faces. I want to remind you, if you are visiting, um, there is a tab you can tear out of the bulletin, and you can place that in the offering plates, either here at the front of the sanctuary or at the back. And that would give us a chance to, to follow up with you. Um, again, we're not going to, you know, I've told this, I guess if you're, you're visiting, you're not hearing this again. But um, if you are visiting and fill that out, don't be afraid. We're not going to just show up at your house. But we would like to send you an email, maybe a text message or phone call and see how we could be of service to you and your family. And, and perhaps uh, uh, answer any questions you have about this family of faith. I want to remind you that for giving tithes and offerings, you can do so at the end of the service by placing them in the offering place Again, located here at the front of the sanctuary or at the back. Additionally, you can give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org. You can also um, drop off or mail to the office. I'd like to share several announcements that we have listed in our bulletin today. I want to remind those who um, are staff and um, are also perhaps committee chair uh, persons that we are having a church council meeting following worship today. In, uh, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall. It will be brief. Um, but uh, we, I hope that if you're able to, you, you'll stay for that so we can make sure that we're coordinating calendar uh, events and those things that are coming up through the end of the year. I want to also remind you that next week we'll have uh, Dr. Rick Bailey will be sharing the sermon uh, for, for our time. We were hoping you know, to have like a, a cover dish and, and all that sort of stuff um, as well. Um, back in June when we scheduled that, we uh, were hoping we were going to be get, having the all clear cover dish. You know, the pandemic was hopefully going to be behind us. But, um, but, but nonetheless, we, we still are excited as we uh, have our, past, our former pastor come and share um, a, a sermon with us and lead in worship next week. So I want to remind you about that. Um, also, I uh, want to remind you, if you did not hear on this past Wednesday, either through the meeting that we had or the phone tr call that came out after the meeting... Um, two weeks following this past Wednesday, which will be September the 29th, we will be having at 6.30 p.m. a special call business meeting here in the sanctuary to vote on this um, instrument, our, uh, the, the potential uh, new organ for our sanctuary. If you have any questions about that, you can see any of our music folks uh, or you can ask me and I'll try to help you out with that. I think there's also some handouts that have information about the organ if you're interested in that. But again, that vote will take place on September the 29th. You'll see also in our um, bulletin, there's information about an, an October 9th fall festival for the youth. And uh, the, the youth, uh, this will be a mission opportunity geared towards helping or accepting donations for the Kennedy Home in Kinston, North Carolina. So there's information there. Um, again, that's on October 9th. More information will come out as we get closer to that event. We'd also like to uh, share with you um, that we're going to begin at the end slash beginning of each month refreshing the prayer list. And so um, we know how prayer lists can go sometimes at church. People can get hung up on the, you know, stuck in the prayer list for a decade or so. So what we're going to do is at the end of each month, we're going to refresh that. If you would like to remain on there for the next, for the following month, let us know. But if you come off at the beginning of a, a new month, don't think we've forgotten you or anything. We're just trying to, to make sure that we kind of know what's going on. Uh, there, so do do note um, that change. Lastly, I would like to welcome this morning Nick Follenweider. He'll be uh, sharing uh, this morning with the cello, and so we're excited to have you sharing your gifts in worship this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we again thank you so much for your presence with us always, and we thank you that as we 
gather to worship you this morning. You, you were with us in a very special way. God, we thank you that as we, uh, as we have this time of worship, as we seek you uh, during this time through prayers, through song, um, through sitting maybe in silence, um, through the, the, the word, through the reading of scriptures, we thank you that in all these things you're continuing to, to help us become who you've called us to be. So, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for being with us in this, in this space. We thank you for being with us always. It's in your name we pray, and it's in Jesus' name we continue to worship. Amen. morning. Good to be back, guys. I missed y'all. This morning I'll be reading from Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners may take, or sit in the company of mockers, but who delights in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his laws day and night. The person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in season, and whose leaves do not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that, that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteousness. For the Lord watches over, over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This morning I'm reading from Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spends it. She's like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servants' girls. She goes in to inspect a field and buys it with her earnings and plants a vineyard. She is energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of, for, of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known in the city gates, where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. This is the word of God.
ask you, would you, could y'all, so I'm going to, I want to call an audible this, uh, this morning. I've been really feeling this past week, just the, the weight of the burden and call for us to, to pray for the people who are on our prayer list, not just mention them and add to it. And so my plan this morning was to have, it is to have during this pastoral prayer time, a time where we were going to be in silence and just, I'm going to just encourage you in, in the silence just to let's pray through this. So if you would grab this, uh, that would be great. But I, I want to add to that, you know, music is, power, is really powerful. It just, it just is. I mean, we see in, in the Psalms, you know, David was a smart guy, and he, he understood the, the power of, of, of music in prayer and, and worship. And so I want to ask you all, I know this is throwing a, a, a curveball or two, um, but if you would play for us just to, to set, just to give us, some music in this space as, as we each where we're at just silently pray through this uh, prayer list could you I don't know what I don't have the music with me so I don't what, know what measure it is so maybe y'all could confer real quick but right before it kind of got a lot of the energy like the more rapido I don't know the word would be can y'all figure out a place maybe about two or three minutes in that would just you could end but play the beginning of, of that piece again for us and when they when they begin, we're gonna we're gonna do that. We're, 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 at, we're gonna pray for the folks that you see here. And there may be other people who are on your heart this morning. And during this time, lift them up. Uh, there are a lot of people who need prayer. And um, as they figure figure out where they're gonna land this thing, when they land it, then I'll I'll close our time. If that's all right. Does that sound good? Figuring out where they need to put the landing gear right now. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. Thank you, guys. All right, let us pray.
Father, as we pour out our hearts to you in this time of prayer and of worship, we give you thanks that you hear us. We give you thanks that you hear the cries of our heart, the pleas for our brothers and sisters for you to move on their behalf. God, as we look at this list of of people in our community and people abroad, God, we recognize the great need that all of humanity has for a Savior, and we give you thanks that you've answered that, that cry for salvation through the giving of your Son, your very own flesh, in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks that wherever we go, there's no place that we can escape your goodness, your presence, your love, your grace, your mercy. We're called to be peacemakers. We're called to to, to go on behalf of our brothers and sisters and and pray for peace and pray for healing and pray for comfort. So God, we, we thank you that you hear these prayers for brothers and sisters, prayers for comfort in their lives, prayers for healing. God, we pray that they will see healing that they will find peace in the midst of times that are chaotic and that it seems that the chaos never ends. God, we pray that you would show us ways that we can be your hands and feet in their lives and maybe be agents of, of your love and grace in their lives. We thank you for the work that you do through us every day. We pray that you would continue to guide us into those good works that you've prepared in advance for us. God, we give you thanks for this community, for the Farmville community, for the Pitt County and Greene County community and the the other counties that surround us that we're located in. We thank you so much for the ways that you continue to to reach out through just the presence of us living in pockets of this community. We thank you for the people that we come in contact with and the ways that we're called to share your love with them every day. And we pray that you would continue showing us and guiding us, that you would continue to, to bear fruit through our lives. This morning as we think about wisdom and what that means, God, give us the courage to to seek wisdom that comes from above. So Lord, we give you thanks for the ways that you're going to answer these prayers. We give you thanks in advance for all that you're planning and are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
In the passage of Scripture that today's sermon comes from, Jesus, the half, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, rather, asks us several questions. To me, three of the questions stand out above all the others in helping us understand that not all wisdom is the same. And that God is calling us as followers of Jesus to seek wisdom and to be wise. Remember, half, uh, Jesus is the half-brother of James, and I've often reminded, in the, I think I've c- preached a couple of sermons from James uh, already, that uh, I've reminded you that to me, ha- having siblings, for one of my siblings, uh, for me to worship one of my siblings as God, they're going to have to, to prove uh, something to me um, about coming back from the dead or something like that. Surely Jesus uh, had that effect on James and on his mother and on his other siblings James writes this book that we find in the New Testament to the early Christians and the early Jews who have scattered among the nations and are suffering persecution and many living in poverty. In addition, they were in social and spiritual conflict and many believers were living in a worldly manner. James writes this book to this letter rather to correct and challenge them to seek God's wisdom to work out these problems that they're experiencing. And if you remember the book of James, he says hard things like, faith without works is dead. Another thing he says is, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. He also says, be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. He also says that the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. So this morning we're going to be looking at James chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 and then chapter 3 verses 13 through 18 and then chapter go back into chapter 4 verses 5 through 10. So if you're confused already I'm sorry. (laughs) I'll try to make it a a little simpler as we do go through it but uh, remember in this passage of scripture we're going to see that James asks quite a few questions but I want to hone in on three of them. The first question that he asks that comes from James chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 is, What causes quarrels and fights among you? So if you have a copy of the Word of God and would like to turn to James chapter 4 now, you can do that. Uh, Otherwise, the scriptures will be on the screen. And James writes in chapter 4 verses 1 through 4, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, this past week, I started making a list of different conflicts and conflicts we see in the news and in different places. Pretty quickly, I, I, figured it, that, I figured out that it would probably not be a good idea to talk too much about the conflicts that we see. We see conflicts, right? I mentioned some of those in a sermon I preached a couple months ago uh, about unity and, the, and the, the call that God has for us to to, to be unified as, as the body of Christ. And if there's anywhere in all the world that there should be unity, it should be in the family of God. You know, unity is something we have to fight for. It's in that Battle Ready sermon series that I preached, the battle for unity. The truth is, though, that our world has a lot of conflict. There's a lot of divide. But what I did, instead of making a list of areas that I see this in, I started making area, like, a list of different conflicts that I find myself engaged in. Have you ever done that before? I mean, it's not something we like wake up in the morning, I'm going to have a cup of coffee and write all the ways I've failed today. I mean, you know, all the ways that I'm like in conflict with people. We don't naturally do that, but it's probably healthy for us too. And so I started making this list. And God kept showing, like, great, we need to add this. And then I'm like, come on, God, I don't want to add a lot. I mean, you know, so I'm making it, and I'm not going to read the list. So if you're waiting for some juicy stuff, I'm not going to read. But I found, I found that this was the truth. Every area of conflict in my life arises, it arises from worldly desires. Every one. Even conflict that I didn't start, that started from someone else. My response to the conflict and to enter into the conflict was not, it didn't come from above. It came from this worldly, fleshly desire. Maybe to prove that I'm right. And maybe I was already right. But then I, well, I need to prove that, you know, the ego throws itself into the mix. James, he asks this question that we're 
going to consider? What causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers it with a rhetorical question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? This is what he says about desires. He goes on in verse 2. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. I mean, he, he, he escalated it pretty quickly. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. All right, it's interesting that James takes this. He answers the question, where do quarrels and conflicts come? And I want to challenge you to do that this week, okay? I think it's healthy in our spiritual walk and spiritual journey and following Jesus that we have some self-reflection, reflect on the things uh, that we may be a conflict, area of conflicts and, and ways that we can resolve that. And very often, uh, we, we, when we do that, God turns the mirror on ourselves. I remember this little old man from the church that I served. Uh, you know, they were kind of fresh on my mind coming uh, back this, this week. There was a, a man named Cecil Beecham, and he, he was very instrumental in the church that I served um, in helping them build a, a new facility. And he would go out every day, and he, and he would do all, all this, you know, just checking on. He was part of that building and grounds committee that, that built the new facilities 20-some years ago. When I first came to the church, he and his, his wife were both shut in. And I, anyway, I would go and, and, and have visits with him. In fact, the last pastoral visit he, he had was from me. And the next day we found out that he had, he had passed uh, very suddenly. It was, it, but, but in that conversation, there was such pride in, in his church and in the church family that was con- continuing to do the work. And he would always share this one story with me about, he said, there was only one guy I'll, I ever had a fight with. Okay. And, and, uh, it, it, it was just this one instance where there was one person. It wasn't really a fight, but it was just a disagreement when it came to building the church facility. It was a you know, disagreement about some of the layout in the courtyard and that sort of thing. I mean, stuff that really is irrelevant now. But he said, we, 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 were, we were like this about it. And I decided, I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray for him to change. He said, and I started praying. And every day I'd pray. You know what happened, Graham? God changed me. He said, God showed me the error of my ways, and, and we were able to easily find a resolution for whatever this thing was that they were, you know, up in arms about. Isn't that how it works, though? When we really seek God, like, sometimes we seek God with an agenda, all right? Like, we, we're in a, talking to someone, we're in an argument, with someone, I need, I need the, the word of God on my side. So we go and we find one verse, and we you know, we get a nice Facebook background to it, um, you know, and then pop, pop it up there like this is, this is really going to get them. Um, and it doesn't, by the way. It's, it's, anyway, I've never heard of anyone being saved from Facebook or any argument being proven right from a post. But that's kind of the way we approach the scriptures sometimes. I'm going to go and get my, my, the, the ammunition I need for this argument. But often if we really are seeking God, God turns the mirror on ourselves. I think that's what James is tapping into here. He says, you don't know how to ask God. I was reminded of a church I served one time. I know I'm bringing up church stories uh, today. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't really plan that many of them, but uh, the, the Spirit is telling me, I reckon. I, I had this one guy who had these things that he was trying to seek God for in his life. And every time we would do the prayer request, for, for this, this group of, of adults, they weren't just youth, you just fake this from a youth, adults, this guy would always say, but I, we need to pray for the Panthers. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, the Carolina Panthers football team, right? I mean, even out of season, we were praying, he was wanting to pray, and eventually I had to have a talk with him, look, man, the Panthers, if the Panthers is the most important thing in your life, and obviously, based on the prayer requests, it is, we probably need to sort some of this stuff out. You don't know how to ask. And maybe we don't ask for the Carolina Panthers to win or the Atlanta Braves to eventually win a playoff series. Again, where are my Braves fans at? Um, there's a few of you I know. I know. And there's some Yankee, Yankee fans I recently found out about. Good night. Y'all, y'all are at the bottom of my prayer. I'm just kidding. Now. Just, ki- just kidding. See you in the back. See you in the back. Randy, just joking with you. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. James says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God, against God, excuse me? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I think reading through this this, this week, God just really was like, this, this past week, like I said, has been a week of just deep, 
trying to channel into that idea of Paul just carrying these burdens and just lifting them up to God, even sometimes with, with, with groans that words can't express. You ever been there before? You just feel it. Just, you're just going through and you're just feeling all this stuff and you're just trying to channel it up to God. And sometimes it, just, it doesn't come through with a, a, a sitting down and saying the words out loud, but just the, the yearning of your heart. I think there's a, there's a blessing that God gives when we turn our eyes away from ourselves. And as I was looking at this passage, I thought it's the first question we need to cons- consider today. Where's the conflict in our lives? Where's the conflict even maybe in our spiritual journey with God? The second question I think that James asks is pertinent to us this morning. We have to go back a little bit, go a paragraph back to uh, James chapter 3, verse 13. He asks the question, who is wise and understanding among you. I want you to think for a moment. Who's the, who's the most wise person you know? You don't have to share with someone around you, but who would you consider to be the, the most wise person that you've ever encountered in your life? Well, I think we should measure them up to the scriptures and see if they're truly wise. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Now, he doesn't say the American dream here. And sometimes in, a, in our American context, being citizens of this great country and having the prosperity that we do, where a large percentage of us, even people who wouldn't consider themselves to, to, to be wealthy at all, are among the most wealthy in the world, we would consider the good life to be an American dream. Ownership of possessions, being able to consume goods and not feel it financially. But James says that's not actually the good life. That's not where wisdom comes from. He says in verse 14, If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every evil practice. So what James is going to take here for, this, for these early believers, these Jews that are spread out, that that, that are, he's trying to minister to and to, to, to tell them that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah. He's trying to tell them that there's a, there's, a, there's a type of wisdom that you can have in your life that comes from this world. You may be very, very successful at the things of the world, but there's a wisdom that comes from above. They can't be measured by the fruit of this world. It can't be measured by living a certain dream. It, it's, it's, it's measured... A different way. We see in this scripture right here, he says that the fruit of worldly wisdom, wisdom always in, ends in envy. It, you, you, you may accumulate all the goods, you may accumulate the car, the house, the whatever, fill in the blank, but when you've accumulated it, when you've, when you've taken possession of it, there's, then, then there becomes this other target where you have to get to. Envy, selfishness, ambition, disorder, evil practice. But he says there's a different wisdom that comes from heaven in verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. As I was doing the, the research this past week, I came across a, uh, in, in one of the, the resources that I used this um, extended passage, commentary on the difference between worldly wisdom and wisdom that comes from above and as it relates to our church and how we, how we have relationship with one another and with the community. And instead of trying to retool it and, and put it in my own words after several attempts, I decided I might just share it with you this morning. It comes from Dr. Kathy Dawson, who's at Columbia Theological Seminary. She writes, When we look at our society, we see this earthly, unspiritual, devilish wisdom all around us. Children desire brand name clothing because they see others who wear that clothing as popular and happy. Youth crave the latest in tech toys so they can communicate and promote the self 24-7. Adults look for the greatest car, house, and job that will promote the lifestyle that they believe will bring them fulfillment. 
Sometimes family members are objectified in this way, looking for the best provider, the show wife, or the genius children as a measure of self-worth and achievement. Marketing capitalizes on these attitudes. We are told via commercials that we can be happy if we just use a particular toothpaste or weight loss remedy. We envy others who appear to embody or have what we want, making, ourse- uh, making over ourselves and our homes in their images. That's what Pinterest is about, right? I'm on, I'm on a Pinterest pro- project for Gina right now. I'm, pre- I'm preaching for, confessionally here. One of the most frightening commercials of the past year promotes a family vehicle. The father arrives with excitement, having just completed a treehouse for his children. He finds his young sons playing cards in the vehicle. When the father invites the boys to come play in his creation, the boys respond with a series of questions, asking if the treehouse has leather seats, a DVD player, and amazing speakers, among other things. Is this what the family relationship has become? Simply a weighing of the attributes of different products. A weighing of the attributes of different products. Well, Dr. Dawson continues later and she talks about what church community looks like living in the God-given wisdom. And I thought that was just as important to share as that. She writes... What then does life look like in the church community that lives by God's wisdom? Here are some of the marks of a wise church that this passage provokes. Church officers are chosen on the criteria of godly wisdom rather than how much money they give to the church. Worship leadership is not just handled by paid staff, but it is shared among the church members of all ages and stations. Disputes are handled with mercy and love, seeking peace above selfish ambition. Stewardship becomes not just a season of pledge collection, but a yearly, a year-long spiritual discipline taught and lived by the community. Prayer is not selfish, asking for what will feed individual desires, but seeks the good fruits that will meet the needs of all. Peacemaking and social justice ministries become ways of addressing the earthly wisdom that surrounds us. And lastly, our primary identity is measured by our closeness to God rather than the possessions we've accumulated. Who is wise and understanding among you? Sometimes we can't see that from the outside, can we? The last question I'll ask this morning, and it comes as we move back into James chapter 4 at verse 5, is what does God want? If I was to ask you the question, what does God want, what would your answer be? James asks the question. He says in verse 5, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? It's this image of, of God hovering over us, yearning to dwell in us. Have you ever thought about that before? Sometimes we're taught that you know we're sinners, which we are, and we're in need of grace, which we are, and Jesus offers of grace offers us grace, grace, which he does. And if we believe in Jesus and trust him with our lives, we'll be forgiven of our sins. That happens. And then he'll give us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to guide us, and he does that. But have we ever seen, even like before that happens, just thought about, you know, God's greatest desire is not to hunt down sinners and put them in their place. God's greatest desire is to dwell in all mankind. James says it. Do you think, or do you think the scripture says without reason that God jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell dwell in us? He gives us grace, more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. God longs for relationship with us. He longs to dwell in us. It's for our good and it's for his glory. God knows that the best path for us is the path that we take intimately connected with him. He's the resolution to the conflict, y'all. He is the wisdom that comes 
from above. Living in tune with Him leads to a good life. He brings out of us fruit for His kingdom. Not all wisdom is the same. Not all wisdom is the same. Who do you trust? Who do you trust to make you wise? That question, that question was blaring as I studied these scriptures this week. Who do you trust to make you wise? As God has called me to be your pastor, I tell you what, there are a lot of voices I hear. I get emails all the time from different groups. This is what you, you know, I mean, not people in the church, but just like different groups in, who, who are taking scriptures. Somehow I get added, I guess they, maybe they search church websites and they throw you on this. And I'm, I get like in my spam folders full of people trying to tell me what I need to think and preach and tell. I'm telling you, I, I, I'm so hesitant to bring a word that I don't first see come from the scriptures. There may be bits and pieces and places that I, I pull different things from, but I tell you what, I, my, my hope and prayer every week as I, as I arrive, usually I try to get here about 8, 8.30 on a Sunday morning and spend time in the office praying through the sermon, making tweaks here and there, not so it'll sound good to you, but so that it'll be true. To make sure that it is true. To make sure that it comes from the Word of God. To make sure that it is representative of what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. An overflow. Fruit coming out. And I, I tell you, I recognize that there are a lot of places you can find wisdom these days. We all have phones that, and that, that, that we usually, we have a thing called a what? What's it called on, on, on the social media? A feed? You ever heard that word before? Feed? They kind of weird, like they're trying to feed, feed you something. When you feed somebody something, you're giving them something to eat, right? We take this and we, we, we dine on it, whether it's true or not. We, it has to pass through scriptures. We have to filter it through the scriptures if we're to, to find the truth, to find true wisdom. Not all wisdom is the same. Where do you get yours? Are you lost? Do you not know where to... To start, James tells us, he gives us, he lines it all out right there in verse 7. I read that and I'll do it again. He says, submit yourselves then to God. We don't like that word, y'all. We just don't. There, there, there's a passage in, in uh, Ephesians. Y'all know it says, wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah, we don't like that one. It, I, every time I counsel with a, a, a bride and groom about that passage of Scripture, I, I, I start, you know, I say, this is one of the Scriptures I recommend for a wedding. And usually the brides will... will you know, we'll buck on that. I don't like, I don't like that. And, and, and you know, because we don't like the word submit. Uh, in that passage, though, guys, it tells you you need to die for your wife, though. Okay, it doesn't tell you you need to submit. It says you need to lay your life down and die for her. Okay, so I know I'm, I'm losing some people right now. We don't like the word submit, though. In that Ephesians passage, if we're to truly understand it, there's a lot of beauty there about the relationship a man and a woman are to have. And, guys, if you're not willing to lay down your wife for your life, you need to draw close to Jesus. Let him change your heart. In fact, if, you're not, if, if you don't love your brother and sister enough in this church to lay down your life for them, if, if the day came for that, we need to draw close to Jesus because that's the call he has. Greater love has no one than this that you lay down your life for your brother or sister in Christ. All right? See that? Sorry, I'm getting off on some other little sermons. I'm, we'll say it for some time else. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You know... Sometimes we, 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 we talk about the devil's in my life. The devil's, on, the devil's getting me. J James says just resist him and draw near to God. That's all you got to do. Like resist the devil, draw near to God. Where do you start drawing near to God? Right here in the scriptures, the Holy Bible. We live in a beautiful country that allows us to have one of these. Some of us have five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Yeah, some of you collect one a year. We, we have access. Oh, <laughs> we have access. I'm, I'm hitting on some, some, uh, some strings there. Some. Some of, yeah, you know, we got a lot, I have a lot of Bibles. At one point I had to purge them and not, not get, you know, purged in a bad way, but give some of them away. We have this beautiful opportunity to draw close to God, to see the words of our faith here in the Scripture. 66 books in a library that is bound by leather. Submit yourselves, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. And then he says some weird stuff. But let me explain it. It says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's confession. And he says, grieve, mourn, and wail. What is that? Grieve, mourn, 
and wail. In, in, in the Jewish tradition, they had a habit of, when they were in a time of repentance, they thought about what, they, they thought about what that separation from God was like. And they were sad about it. It was actually built into their spiritual framework. There was a time of, of pouting, so to, so to speak, over what their sin had cost. And James is saying for these, this, this, this new covenant that Jesus has initiated, that that is still relevant. It, 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 I mean, you know, I, I get it. It's, it's, you know, we need to confess our sin and then accept the grace of God, but sometimes we need to slow down and understand what, what in, 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 our, in, in, in walking in a, in a way that's not wise, what that has cost us, maybe cost the people around us. Grieve, mourn, and wail. But then he says, change your life. Well, he continues, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The idea is to lay ourselves completely before the Lord and, 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 and acknowledge the separation that we may have from time to time and allow him to lift us up. As I ask the questions, where do you get your wisdom and explain this morning, hopefully convincingly from the scriptures here, there's a difference between earthly wisdom and wisdom that comes from above. I want to share in concluding a, a cautionary tale regarding sources of wisdom and insight and understanding. The Salem witch trials occurred in February 1692 to May 1693 in colonial Massachusetts. More than 200 people were accused of being witches. 30 people were found guilty, 19 were executed, 5 people died in jail. This is one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria and a cautionary tale of the dangers of isolationism, religious extremism, false accusation, and lapses in due process ever in the history of this great land. In short, a total loss of the insight an understanding that comes from above, and its fruit was shown. The trials were started after people had been accused of witchcraft, primarily by teenage girls, such as Elizabeth Hubbard, as well as some who were even younger than her at age 17. This past week, I saw a, a Facebook post that someone had shared a, an, ex, an uh, experience that um, a, a person they had known had shared about a history teacher related to this, and it went like this. One of my friends told me about a powerful lesson in her daughter's high school class recently. They're learning about the Salem witch trials, and their teacher told them they were going to play a game. I'm going to come around and whisper to each of you whether you're a witch or a regular person. Your goal is to build the largest group possible that does not have a witch in it. At the end, any group found to include a witch gets a failing grade. The teens dove into grilling each other. One fairly large group formed, but most of the students broke into small, exclusive groups, turning away anyone they thought gave off even a hint of guilt. Okay, the teacher said, you've got your groups. Time to find out which ones fail. All witches, please raise your hand. No one raised a hand. The kids were confused and told the teacher that he had messed up the game. Did I? He questioned. Was anyone in Salem an actual witch? Or did everyone just believe what they'd been told? Not all wisdom is the same. Where do you get yours? Let's stand for our benediction. Father, we're thankful that you give wisdom to us. We're thankful that when we knock on your door and when we seek you, the door opens and we find you. Lord, we're thankful that you have revealed yourself to us through the scriptures and that we're able to have a copy in this country. God, we're thankful that you give wisdom that comes from above that supersedes any wisdom of this earth. God, we pray that we would be people who are found to be wise. That yes, we would have a certain amount of wisdom of dealing with things on, on this earth, but God, that we would trust, we would fully trust wisdom that comes from you. 
that wisdom that, that, that brings peace into our lives and into our communities, understanding, love, and joy. God, we thank you so much for the gift that Jesus gave in giving his life for us. In his wisdom, he knew exactly what we needed. God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit into our lives. And we pray that we would trust your Holy Spirit as you give us guidance. It's in Jesus' name that we give thanks for this time of worship. And it's in Jesus' name that we go. Amen. May you go in peace. Amen.